So in this discussion, we're going to look at the psychological aspects of injury and rehabilitation. So we're just going to kind of talk about some important things to consider anytime you're rehabilitating a patient, uh, looking at the psychological aspect of this. Uh, you know, again, different patient populations will respond, you know, behaviorally and emotionally kind of different to injuries depending on, you know, situational factors. And we're going to discuss that, maybe what are some things to look at, and maybe some ways you could kind of enhance this aspect of rehabilitation for your patient. And if need be, you know, possibly refer them for counseling if, if it's, you know, it starts to get kind of outside the scope of practice um, to counsel them with this, um, we can we can do referral for that purpose. So what are some factors that affect patient outcomes as far as injury is concerned? So obviously the characteristics of the injury, you know, you know, the severity, things of that nature, just, you know, looking at how long based on the severity of the injury will keep the individual out of uh, competition or activity for whatever it may be, depending upon your patient population, uh, specific situational factors um, that the person has, whether that's personally with their family, situationally as far as um, maybe even how the injury occurred, you know, where they're at in their athletic career, things of that nature. There, there's various things that, that could be um, impactful there. Interactions with healthcare providers, obviously, you know, you want to have a positive interaction between the patient and the healthcare provider can definitely go a long way. Making Having a positive rapport there can be very beneficial. Uh, differences in personalities. Um, some personalities can, you know, kind of handle adversity better than others. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about some different things involving, you know, how the person views themselves and, and how important their, you know, activity level is and everything and as far as that goes. And just individual cognitive appraisal. So, you know, what the individual thinks about the, the injury and the situation. So kind of how a person you know, sort of assimilates and brings these factors together will kind of dictate what their emotional and behavioral responses are. So, you know, whether, you know, emotionally, they'll kind of be fearful or angry because of the injury. And then behaviorally, like how will they adhere to their, their treatment plan? Um, so those are all very important things. And, you know, a lot of patient experiences are going to impact you know, the cognitive, behavioral, and emotional aspects of this, they're kind of like the three big things we look at as far as how the individual psychologically is, is dealing with the injury. So psychological responses to injury. So, you know, consider some, you know, different psychosocial barriers that the individual so the, the psychosocial factors or, or psychosocial barriers, rather, are just things that are caused by other factors other than the injury that could have a negative impact on, um, on the individual's uh, adherence to the rehabilitation program. Focus on treating the entire patient. So again, you know, even though it's a patient who sprained their ankle, you know, think, you know, kind of holistically about how they're kind of responding and how they're kind of dealing with the injury. Um, understanding your scope of practice and your role. So obviously, you know, we're looking at being the, the rehab, rehabilitation from a physical standpoint perspective. And yes, we, we have some and, and there's going to be some things that you could recognize psychologically, but we're not, we're not inherently able to, you know, provide uh, that, that type of treatment to them from a, from a, a counseling and psychological factor. So it's important to recognize when referral is necessary. If you start to see a downturn in the patient that, that could be involving some, some psychological issues as it relates to their injury, it, it would probably be a good discussion to have to, you know, discuss with them possible referral to somebody who um, is, is more qualified and it's within the scope. You, you certainly can assist with that process, but, um, you know, the, the primary counseling and everything needs to be done by a, by a mental health professional. So the, one of the early models kind of that we looked at so that a lot of people sort of applied. Now, now the, the Kubler-Ross five-stage response was a model that was originally designed over suffering, loss, or bereavement um, due to illness and disability. 
um, we, we started to apply this to musculoskeletal injury and to a degree it could work, but we'll kind of talk about some of the shortcomings of it in regards to musculoskeletal injury. So the five stages, first one being denial and isolation, second anger, third bargaining, four depression, and five acceptance is this five stage response. And, and at first it was believed that with musculoskeletal injury, individuals experience this. However, you know, when they kind of looked at what athletes were, you know, and, and people who were physically active were kind of dealing with, a, a lot of times they didn't necessarily experience all of the five stages. Um, typically, and what they tend to find for the most part is that most athletes, even if they're having kind of a hard time with, with injury and being held out from activity, they actually don't experience depression a whole lot. Now, athletes can certainly suffer from depression if they do suffer a severe injury and, you know, they either, you know, either their career ends or they you know, they, you know, they lose a significant amount of time during a sports season, but uh, depression's not a thing usually associated with musculoskeletal injury and and a lot of athletes too also tend not tend to not deny the injury they they usually try to make sense of it is what they usually try to do so so there's kind of some some holes that they are kind of experienced as far as using the 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 kubler ross theory with this um, there are some other models that maybe apply a little bit better particularly to musculoskeletal injury so it's it's still important to know this kind of be able to recognize some things, but just know that, you know, you usually don't have a, a direct connection between this type of modeling and what um, athletes will typically experience or just physically active people will experience with musculoskeletal injuries. So a better model to look at are the biopsychosocial model. So basically you want to kind of recognize how an injury affects everyday life. And again, this doesn't necessarily have to just apply to athletic populations. It could even be involved with just people who are just physically active. Remember, as athletic trainers, our, our patient population is the physically active, even though, you know, in, in most situations we're dealing with people in competitive athletics, physically, this, this could apply to physically active people. So the International Classification of Functioning by the World Health Organization, they kind of incorporate disease, bodily function, activity, and environmental factors in this. And what we have is something, if you look at the bottom picture um, down in here, the, the Negi's disablement model, um, all they do is basically take disease and swap it out for musculoskeletal injury. So basically you have musculoskeletal injury, impairment, functional limitation, and then disability. And, you know, so the, you basically look at that, that flow that kind of then can easily apply this model in as far as musculoskeletal injuries are concerned. So in, in biopsychosocial models, injury is more than just tissue damage. You know, the attention kind of gets focused on the person's entire response to the injury. So how is the person responding to the impairment they have? How is the person responding to the fact that they can't do their normal activities that they're used to doing, whatever they may be, okay? So, you know, the clinician should really be discussing the impact of the injury with the patient and, and try not to necessarily assume he or she knows what the patient's goals are. So, you know, when you're goal setting for the patient, you know, include the patient in that. So again, this kind of, this concept again, tries to again, get across the idea that we have to treat more than just the injury. Obviously the musculoskeletal injury is a concern. So we have to look at what that musculoskeletal injury means as far as what the, the patient can and can't do in everyday life or maybe even what their, what their individual goals are in life. Okay, so it's kind of another model, again, kind of looking at, you know, the fact that the grief and stage model doesn't quite, uh, you know, that it involves more with death and dying than, than musculoskeletal injury. There's something also called cognitive appraisal models. So cognitive appraisal models were basically looking at an individual's understanding um, the, the psychological response to the injury. So cognitive appraisals uh, look at suggesting that the personal attributes or the individual's attributes and the situational factors are things that contribute to an individual's response to the injury. And those individual appraisals 
then kind of affect emotional and behavioral responses. Another thing to kind of note about this is that this will occur when the injury happens and it'll also occur throughout the healing process. So cognitive appraisal of the situation is going to happen throughout, um, throughout the entire injury process. So it's really important to recognize that and that some, some things may change over the course of time as the individual is being treated. So again, this model just kind of looks at the individual's um, responses to the injury and how it's related to these, to these different factors. And we're gonna look at some other points with cognitive appraisals and kind of how this could progress throughout the, the rehabilitation process. So when we look at cognitive appraisal models, um, the appraisals influence an individual's coping. There's really gonna be two appraisals that basically happen. There's gonna be what's called a primary appraisal and that's basically an assessment of things like benefit, threat, harm, you know, loss, you know, with respect to the challenge. So some things like that and how that'll impact the individual um, who is injured. And a secondary appraisal, which assesses the coping options available. So one of the important things is if a person, you know, thinks they're going to experience a lot of loss with this or difficulty, what are the coping options? So coping is an individual's ability to deal with a stressful situation. So, you know, they have to be able to then look at what coping options do they have? So again, primary appraisal looks at that, that overall assessment of, of the, the situational aspects and then the secondary appraisal kind of looks at the coping options that are available. And coping is gonna depend on a lot of things. It's gonna depend on their individual circumstances. So what's their environment? Do they have a supportive fan? Do they have supportive family members? Do they have supportive teammates? Um, you know, and just individual differences and, and different um, differences in as far as just cognitively how they look at the situation, their own individual cognitive appraisal impacts uh, the coping resources as well. So just looking how cognitive appraisal difference versus stage model. So, you know, three, three primary ways that the cognitive uh, uh, approach is different from the stage models that we see with something like Kubler-Ross. Um, stages can be completely absent during the cognitive appraisal model. So there's no like, obviously there's no set, you know, order in which a person experiences things with cognitive appraisal models. The psychological, you know, emotional response typically doesn't occur in a structured order and it could vary based upon you know again over the course of the appraisals throughout the healing process and things like that the and the third one is the response may be affected by an understanding of the injury and in, in psychosocial environment so those are all things that will significantly impact this and again an individual in the end will decide whether they adapt and cope or exhibit maladaptive behaviors um, as a result of the ap appraisal model. So, you know, it could kind of go one of two ways. And again, there's always a constant uh, appraisal that's going on throughout the, the injury process, okay? You know, for instance, as we said, you know, comparing and contrasting with stage models, for instance, depression doesn't happen a whole lot of times. Now, it can happen, and if it does happen, you have to recognize it because it can become a significant barrier to uh, recovery and to, you know, in some instances, maybe even um, an individual being able to maintain, you know, treatment adherence and things of that nature. So that's an important thing to, to note. But, you know, typically when you look at these musculoskeletal injury situations, you're not going to have that kind of staged response or, or things that aren't gonna incur, aren't gonna occur in a, in a structured order, you know, there's just going to be that, again, that appraisal that takes place and, and then there are the behaviors that, that will be exhibited because of that. So here's, uh, when you, so again, clinician patient interaction and, and, you know, having dealt with patients for, for a number of years and, you know, dealing with young active athletes, how you interact with patients is very important. So this is kind of a thought question that I'm going to throw out there. So I, I want you to kind of do this on your own as a part of watching this video, but I want you to write down what are some important characteristics 
of effective communication that you want to have with your patients. Okay, so think about that. Look in the chapter and the text and kind of jot some things down. But just for for an, for an active perspective, what are some important characteristics we want to note? So kind of to jot some of those down, um, and we'll we'll discuss those further in class. So when we look at the emotional response to injuries and, and some of the different feelings that a person might have in response to an injury, again, usually br brief, um, and it, it could have a positive effect on coping if you know the emotions are controlled. You know, one of the big things is the athletes have to accept the reality of injury, so they have to accept it for what it is, but they also have to accept fluctuating emotions. There may be some days where they're, you know, a little bit more positive, some days they're, you know, where they may have some more negative emotions. And as the clinician, you have to understand that as well. Um, it is a very complex and dynamic process. So it, it's a complex process. There's a lot of personal factors that will play into this, this emotional response. So, you know, for instance, a person's self-esteem, self-worth, self-confidence, self-efficacy, or, or some of the things that will kind of have effects on this response to injury uh, and self-perception may influence an individual's coping and it could it could work either way a high self-perception could aid with coping or it could lead to negative emotions and inability to cope so this is another discussion point I want you to kind of think about is in what ways could a high self-perception help with the coping response and in what ways could it lead to negative emotions and an inability to cope? Because we all know that both of these things can um, be, you know, can be positive or negative depending upon how a person views them. And it should be noted that from, from an athlete's perspective, elimination of athletics can be negative regardless of other positives in life. So, and we'll, we'll talk about why that could be and, and what are some of the, the psychological things that are, are kind of dealt with when we look at you know, despite someone having a lot of other great things in life, why that elimination of athletics can be very negative. So an important factor with this is the concept of athletic identity. So when the, the, the negative emotions that may occur when you have an individual who experiences you know, when you're dealing with competitive athletics, an individual who experiences a, a you know, severe enough injury to where it's going to impact their, their return, you're looking at a part of their life being taken away. So, you know, the injury gives them a lot of negative emotions, possibly causing them to have, you know, very reclusive behavior habits. Um, basically, when, when an individual has a very strong athletic identity, an injury threatens their perception and, and kind of their their overall life identity. So they're an individual with a high self perception related to their athletic ability could be a very could be a very negative thing in this regard because if that if that's now taken away from them, um, that's something that's going to you know possibly have some psychological ramifications throughout the rehabilitation process. So, and this concept's further identified by looking at what they call athletic masculine identity. So again, all that basically is, is looking at their, that their identity is really highly related to their team or sport, and that their self-perception is tied to that so much that that includes a lot of their self-worth, that when that's taken away from them, that's a big part of their life. So this influences, and again, what's going to influence this are some certain things. So the severity of the injury, the timing of the injury, and again, their coping resources are gonna be all things that could, you know, possibly if some of those things aren't adequate enough, could, could kind of amplify the, the issue with this. So if a person has a very high athletic identity, and again, that's taken away from them, it's a severe injury, they don't have a whole lot of good coping resources, that could certainly be something that could be, you know, very damaging to the to the individual. So now we look at the behavioral responses. So 
Um, you know, this has a, a big effect as far as the adherence to the plan of care. So it's very important that, you know, your patients adhere to what it is you're trying to do. Um, and their behavioral response to injury can, can definitely have a, a positive or negative impact on it. So, you know, and again, there's going to be appraisal and emotional responses are going to, are obviously going to affect this as well. Um, positive responses that individuals have as far as positive behavioral responses include goal setting, using imagery, positive self-talk, relaxation. So these are all techniques that are, are definitely uh, benefits to the behavioral response. And individuals who do these sort of things are more than likely to follow the rehabilitation program that you're doing so that, you know, it requires them to take action, kind of exert control. Most people that adhere very well to, to, re, to rehabilitation programs, particularly in situations that can be very stressful with, you know, so, you know may, severe injuries and losing significant amount of time from activity. So those that adhere usually use psychological skills. They have a good social network. Um, you know, they're, they're okay with risk taking. They understand the, the risk involved in sports. Um, you know, there's a lot of effort, pursuit of rehabilitation goals. That's why it's important to have individuals involved in the goal setting process. And they, they adhere positively. And, and, you know, a lot of good adherence um, positively correlates with self-motivation. So self-motivated individuals, a lot of times as well, will be more than likely to follow the, the rehabilitation program that you're, you're providing. Again, it's important to you as the clinician to make them a part of that process. Obviously, you're the professional, you're the individual who kind of really knows what they can and can't do, but to kind of work with them in that uh, could really be a positive and, and could really improve uh, rehabilitation adherence.